Okay, let's open our Bibles. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 7. Isaiah chapter 7. And we're going to begin with just one verse, verse 14. But don't worry, there will be plenty <laughs> more that we will be reading. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Let me read the verse, and then let's start to dig into it. Therefore, we are told, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. This is God's holy, inspired, authoritative word of truth. And all of God's people say, amen. Okay, well, as you can see on the screen behind me, today is part two of our two-part series where we are taking a look at some, not all, but some of the Old Testament promises pointing to Christ. Again, as we are making our way towards Christmas, where we celebrate the birth of our Savior, we thought it would be good to kind of prepare all of us to celebrate Christmas and to prepare us by taking a look at several Old Testament promises pointing to Christ. Last week, if you were with us, we saw some of those promises, one that started all the way back in the book of Genesis, in chapter 3, verse 15, where God, right there in the midst of the fall, after Adam and Eve had disobeyed the Lord, we see God's grace, we see God's mercy, where God pronounced a curse on Satan, and God also promised that the Messiah would come. He would be the seed of the woman and that the Messiah would reverse the curse, the curse of sin and death, and that he would crush Satan's head. As we discussed last week, that first promise pointing to Christ, theologians call that the proto Evangelion or Evangelion, proto meaning first, Evangelion meaning good news. And again, as we saw last week, right there in the midst of corruption, the fall, we see God's grace and mercy shining through, promising and giving good news that the Messiah was going to come to conquer sin and death and crush Satan. Well, we also saw a few other Old Testament promises where God promised that the seed would come through the family of a man by the name of Abraham. Isaac would be his promised son. Isaac would have two boys. The promised one would be Jacob. And so, we see in the Old Testament God promising that the seed was going to come through the family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob's name would eventually be changed to Israel. He would have 12 sons, the 12 tribes of Israel, and God promised that it would be through the tribe of Israel. Judah, that the Messiah would come. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the tribe of Judah, and a particular man in the tribe of Judah who was, whose name was David, King David. God promised that it would be through David's house that the Messiah would come, the Messiah whose throne and kingdom would last forever. And so we have the promise of the coming seed, 
there in Genesis 3.15. He would come through the family of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the tribe of Judah, and the house of David, and the Messiah's kingdom would last forever. And we connected in the Old Testament those Old Testament promises we studied last week. Well, today, we're going to take a look at some more of these Old Testament promises, and we will also connect them to the New Testament passages. Now, again, God in His grace didn't leave any room for human speculation when it came to recognizing the Messiah. Here in our verse today, Isaiah 7, 14, God said through the prophet Isaiah, by the way, writing about 700 years before the birth of Christ, God said through the prophet Isaiah, that the Lord himself will give you a sign, a sign that would help the people clearly recognize who the Messiah was. The Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child. Your attention, please. You think that would be a pretty big sign? Yeah, because as you know, virgins do not give birth, <laughs> right? <laughs> but this is very interesting. Not only would a virgin be with child, but God said she is going to bear a what? Son. Now, I want you to think about this. We know that males have chromosomes, right? Just like females do. And the male chromosomes are X, Y. Females are X, X. God here says that a virgin, X, X, is going to be with child. And as startling as that is, God said she, XX, is going to bear a son, XY, without ever having relations with a man. You see, the natural way people are born, you have a woman, X, X, having relations with a man, X, Y. The male sperm, X, Y, is introduced to the female egg. And in many instances, the result is a male child. But here, not only would a virgin be impregnated without having sexual relations with a man, but the virgin who is XX will give birth to a son, XY with no introduction of male sperm. And not only would a virgin be with child, obviously a stunning statement, not only would this virgin bear a son, stunning statement, but she will call his name Emmanuel. 
which means in Hebrew what? God with us. What? Yes. 700 years before the birth of Christ. After God had already given numerous Old Testament promises pointing to Christ. Promised seed who would reverse the curse and crush Satan's head would come through the family of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the tribe of Judah, the house of King David, and the Messiah's throne and kingdom would last forever. And God said, how about this? The Lord himself will give you a sign so that you don't miss the Messiah. What would that sign be? A virgin will be with child and bear a son and she will call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. You think that's a pretty big sign God gave? Yeah. In fact, just hop over to chapter 9. We learn more about this child who would be born. Uh, he wouldn't just be a normal, uh, regular child. <laughs> We're told, verses 6 and 7, that a child will be born to us. Many theologians believe that refers to the humanity of Christ. A child will be born to us. A son will be given to us. Again, many theologians believe that that refers to the deity of Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, the monogenes, the supreme one, the only one, referring to his deity. And so we see here, again, through Isaiah, 700 years before the birth of Christ, God not only said, hey, I'm going to give you a sign, a virgin is going to be with child. She's going to bear a son, and you are to call him Emmanuel. Here in chapter 9, we're told a child, referring to his humanity, will be born to us. A son, the son, referring to his deity, will be given to us. And the government will rest on his shoulders. He is the supreme, sovereign one. Wow, not an ordinary child. In fact, we are told his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. God with us referring to the incarnation of Christ, God with us, that which we celebrate at Christmas. A child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, or Possessor, or Owner of all things, Prince of Peace. Through Christ, we have peace with God forever. There will be no end, verse 7, to the increase of His government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. And the zeal of Yahweh, the Lord of hosts, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Whoa. Not an ordinary child, <laughs> Not an ordinary birth, right? <laughs> you think God was uh, putting up some very clear promises here in the Old Testament, pointing to Christ? 
And so we see the promise of a virgin birth. We see the promise that this child would be no ordinary child. It would be God with us. One person, two natures. Truly human, truly divine. Mighty God in the flesh. And then go to Micah chapter 5. God even gives the exact location where this supremely special child would be born. Micah chapter 5, verse 2. Again, Micah, writing around 700 years before the birth of Christ, God said through Micah, But as for you, verse 2, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah. Bethlehem, Ephrathah, a little, little, small, little, tiny place in Judah. From you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, one, the one, the supreme one, the only one will go forth from me, God says, to be ruler in Israel. His goings, referring to the one to be, who will be born, are from long ago, from the days of eternity. Well, that makes sense. Second person of the Trinity, the self-existent, eternal, most holy second person of the Trinity, 2,000 years ago, humbled himself. And in his incarnation, God with us took on flesh. He was born. He was in the womb of a virgin. He was born in a very small, insignificant town. He is the everlasting one, the glorious one, mighty God who took on flesh. And can we be certain that Jesus is that promised Messiah? We saw last week that he is the promised seed through the family of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, tribe of Judah, house of David, whose kingdom and throne last forever. Well, let's take a look at his unique birth happening in a very, well, at least from a human perspective, seemingly insignificant place. Let's go to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew, as we saw last week, verses 1 through 17, writing to a Jewish audience, he starts out with the human genealogy of Christ because he knew the Jews were waiting for that seed to come through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, tribe of Judah, and the house of David. So that's why Matthew, as I taught you last week, started out his gospel with the human genealogy of Christ. Well, after that... Matthew turns to the unique birth of Christ. Verse 18, we're told, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, before they had any sexual relations, she was found to be with child. How? Not by another man, rather by the Holy Spirit. Well, that now is starting to make sense because in Isaiah 7, 14, God said, here's a huge sign I'm going to give you. A virgin is going to be with child. Well, how's that possible if she has no physical relations with a man? Well, we're told here that this young virgin, Mary, before she and Joseph had come together, they were betrothed, 
They were going to get married. Suddenly she's pregnant. Joseph wasn't the, the father of this child. At least he's not the reason why she was preg impregnated. No other man was. Well, how is it possible that she was impregnated as a virgin? Answer, by the Holy Spirit, the third member of the Trinity. Well, Joseph, at first, he, he was kind of in shock, and rightly so. His, you know, <laughs> wife-to-be, Mary, suddenly is pregnant. And he's like, I didn't do it. <laughs> so Joseph, verse 19, being a righteous man, not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, verse 20, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, um, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, the baby in Mary's womb did not have a sin nature like every other baby in the mother's womb. Because Jesus was not conceived in the natural way. Two sinners, male, female, coming together and producing a baby with a sin nature. No. Jesus was conceived in the supernatural way, in the womb of a virgin. No physical relations with Joseph or any other man. And yet, as God had promised in Isaiah 14, a virgin will be with child and she will give birth to a what? Son. Virgin, XX, giving birth to a son, X, Y. How's that possible? Because we are told here, what has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son. And you shall call his name Jesus. Why? For he will save his people, the elect, from their sins. And then look what Matthew says to his Jewish audience. Uh, don't be surprised about this, guys. This, verse 22, Matthew says to the Jews, all took place, this virgin birth, this all took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Which prophet? Isaiah, 700 years earlier. Behold, verse 23, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means, which translated means God with us. And Joseph awoke from his sleep. Talk about <laughs> that dream, right? And he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took Mary as his wife, but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son. He called his name Jesus. Wow. Jesus is the fulfillment of the promise God made back in Isaiah, right? Isaiah 7, 14, Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7. And where was Jesus born? Go to Luke chapter 2. We get our answer there. Now, it's interesting, Mary and Joseph were from, were from Nazareth in Galilee, northern part of Israel. But didn't God say through the prophet Micah, chapter 5, verse 2, that the Messiah would be born where? Not in Nazareth, but in Bethlehem, Ephrathah, in Judah. That's southern part of Israel. Well, wait a second. How is it that Mary and Joseph were going to get from Nazareth down to Bethlehem 
at the exact time where Mary would then give birth and Jesus would fulfill God's promise through Micah and be born in Bethlehem. How would that happen? Answer, chapter 2, starting in verse 1. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. And by the way, we're told, verse 2, this was the first census taken while Curnius was governor of Syria. Your attention, please. Caesar Augustus, most powerful man running the Roman Empire, decides (laughs) one day, hey, I want to have a census. A census would be taken so that the Romans would know exactly how many conquered peoples were under their authority. And also, the Romans would know how many people they could tax so that the Roman Empire could function economically. And so, a census was taken, which required all the males there in Israel to return back to their place of birth to register. So again, the Romans would know how many people were under their authority and the Romans could tax them. So again, we're told, verse 1, in those days, you know, the days when Jesus was going to be born. We're told a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth, of all the peoples, not just the peoples who were in Israel, but all the conquered peoples under Rome's authority. We're told, verse 2, again, this was the first census taken while Curnius was governor of Syria, and here it is, verse 3, everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city, his place of birth. We're told, verse 4, Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth, where he was living with Mary while she was pregnant, and he went to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. Why'd he go there? because he was of the house and family of David. That's where Joseph was from. And he went there, verse 5, we're told, in order to register, along with Mary, who was engaged to him, and oh, by the way, we're told by Luke, end of verse 5, she was pregnant. She was with child. Verses 6 and 7. While they were there, where? Bethlehem. We know how they got there. We know why they got there. God moved the heart of this pagan guy, Caesar Augustus, to issue this decree that a census would be taken. Kicks everything in motion. Joseph has to leave. Nazareth. Mary, who's pregnant, go, comes goes with him. Where do they go? Down to Bethlehem. Why? That's where Joseph was originally from. And we're told, while they were there, Not on the way down, but while they were there in Bethlehem, the days were completed for her to give birth. She gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in cloths, laid him in a manger or animal trough because there was no room for them in the inn. Do you see how? Jesus was born in Bethlehem? You understand why? Because God had promised that through the prophet Micah 700 years earlier that it would be Bethlehem, Ephrathah. Very, very small, seemingly insignificant place in Judah. God promised that would be the place where the Messiah would be born. Did Jesus fulfill that? He's the promised seed who came to reverse the curse 
of sin and death. He's from the family of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. He's from the tribe of Judah, the house of David. He was born of the Virgin Mary, conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. And this miraculous birth took place where? In Bethlehem. Where? God came to be with us. The second person of the Trinity left his heavenly throne and was born of the Virgin, conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, was carried in the womb of Mary, and was born in Bethlehem. Not Jerusalem, the capital. Not uh, some other big name place in Israel, no. Not up in Rome, no. In Bethlehem. And we're told that the king of glory was laid in an animal trough. Think about it. Census. Could have caused a ton of people to go back to their place of birth. The place would have been crowded. Bethlehem's a small town. It's not like you had a lot of hotels open, right? And the result, the king of glory, the promised seed, whose kingdom and throne last forever, he was placed in a fatne animal trial. He wasn't placed on a throne. He didn't have a royal robe. They wrapped him in cloths. And he wasn't wearing a kingly crown. They put him in an animal trough. Which gives us an idea that the king of glory would also be the suffering servant. That from eternal exaltation, the king of glory would experience humiliation. Carried in the womb, of a human, by the way, who also had a sin nature like everyone else, Mary. Born in a very, very tiny, tiny place. Not the capital city. And not placed on a throne there in Jerusalem at the temple. Rather put in an animal trough. From exaltation to humiliation. The king of glory, the suffering servant. Let me show you some of those Old Testament promises. Go to Isaiah. Go right back where we were a little while ago. Isaiah chapter 50. And again, I, I think obviously people are very familiar about all that our Lord endured, you know, his suffering there at the cross, but I'm not sure a lot of people understand that that also was promised in the Old Testament, that that is exactly what would happen to the Messiah. Now, I want you to pay special attention to the details 
of these promises, just like we saw the detail of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, David, virgin birth in Bethlehem, all that. I want you now to pay attention to the details describing what was going to happen to the Messiah as the suffering servant. In fact, here in Isaiah chapter 50, we have what theologians refer to as the servant song. The words of the coming Messiah, the servant, the suffering servant's song, describing in detail the type of suffering he would endure. In fact, if you want to write this down, there are four servant songs here in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 42 is the first. Chapter 49 is the second. Here, which we're going to see in a few moments, chapter 50 would be your third servant song. And then the fourth servant song is at the end of chapter 52 and all of chapter 53. And we'll take a look at that one as well. And so here in Isaiah 50, we have the third of four servant songs. And I want to draw your attention to verses four through seven. Again, this is the Messiah 700 years before his incarnation, describing what was going to happen to him. Verse 4, the Lord Yahweh, the Lord God, has given me the tongue of disciples, that I may know how to sustain the weary one with a word. He awakens me. Morning by morning, he awakens my ear to listen as a disciple. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not disobedient, nor did I turn back. Again, the words of the Messiah giving us a picture of what was to come. I was not disobedient, nor did I turn my back. Christ here on earth submitted to the will of the Father and the power of the Spirit and was obedient, Philippians chapter 2, obedient to the point of death. I was not disobedient, nor did I turn my back. Now watch this. Rather, verse 6, I gave my back to those who strike me. Imagine that. And my cheeks to those who pluck out the beard. I did not cover my face from humiliation and spitting. For the Lord God helps me, therefore I am not disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like flint. Our Lord, from that animal trough all the way to the cross, he set his face like flint to fulfill his mission, to bring glory to God and salvation to the elect. I set my face like flint and I know I will not be ashamed. Some key words you want to underline in this servant song. Verse 6, I gave my back. Verse 6, my cheeks. Verse 6, my face. And spitting. And what ended up happening to that precious face? 
chapter 52, at the end. Another servant song, verse 14. Just as many were astonished at you, my people, his appearance, talking about the coming Messiah, was marred more than any man. His face was beaten beyond recognition. His face was pulverized. And his form, his body, more than the sons of men. This is what was going to happen to the Messiah. Even more details. Chapter 53, who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he, the Messiah, grew up before him, the Father, like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. Think of a root when you walk in the woods. What do you do with the root? Probably just kick it, right? Yeah. This is how he would be considered. From Nazareth, because that's where he grew up. We read, he has no stately form or majesty that we should look at him. He didn't show up again sitting on the throne. He didn't show up with a royal robe or a royal crown. No, he had no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. How about that one? God in the flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. And look how the people would mistreat him. They would abuse his back. They would punch his face. They would pluck out his beard. They would mock him and humiliate him and spit on his face. His face would be beaten beyond recognition. His body abused beyond recognition. I guess he wasn't attractive enough to them. Again, he had no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, do you think? A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief and like one from whom men hide their face. He was despised. What, from Nazareth? And we did not esteem him. This was written 700 years before the birth of Christ. Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried, yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted, but he was pierced through for our transgressions. Pretty clear, huh? He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging, we are healed. And why do we all need a Messiah? Answer verse 6. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord, the Father, has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him, the promised Messiah. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted. Yet he didn't open his mouth as he was being led to the cross. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent before it shears, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. Crucifixion, death. And for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living? He died. Why? For the transgression of my people, not his transgression, to whom the stroke was due. The people, not him. His grave was assigned with wicked men. Think of Jesus hanging on the cross between two wicked criminals. Yet with a rich man, 
in his death. His body was taken down by Joseph of Arimathea and placed in the Joseph's unused tomb. Joseph was a wealthy man. This was all promised 700 years before it happened. He had done no violence, end of verse 9, nor was any deceit in his mouth. He's the perfect one. We are the guilty ones. Verse 10, but the Lord, Yahweh, was pleased to crush him, the son, putting him to grief so that he would render himself as a guilt offering in our place because of our guilt. But he would not be in that grave forever. No, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days, referring to the resurrection. And the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, referring to the Messiah, he will see it and be satisfied, fulfilling the mission, saving sinners like you and me. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many. He will bear their iniquities. Therefore, God says about the Messiah, I will allot him a portion with the great. He is the eternal king who rules over his eternal kingdom. And he will divide the booty with the strong because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. Wow. The promised seed through the line of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, tribe of Judah, house of David. And his kingdom and throne would last forever. He would be born of the virgin, conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit in his own incarnation, Emmanuel, God with us. He would be born in Bethlehem, put into an animal trough, and he set his face like flint to fulfilling his mission. And nobody and nothing was going to stop him, no matter how brutally they beat his back, no matter how violently they punched his face, no matter how much they humiliated him and despised him and spit on him. He would go to that cross to save lost, sinful, guilty sheep like you and me. Do you see God's promises here in the Old Testament pointing to the Christ? Who would be the suffering servant to save people? who can't save themselves. And oh, by the way, let me show you some New Testament passages that connect that which was promised in the servant songs to Christ. Go to Mark chapter 14. Verses 53 through 65, after Jesus had been betrayed and arrested, he was brought in front of the Jewish religious elite, the Sanhedrin. They had a mock trial. They were determined, these bloodthirsty hypocrites, to have Jesus eliminated. But the Jews were under the Romans. They didn't have the power to crucify somebody. So here we see the initial trial, the mock trial, the farce of a trial, in front of the Jewish religious leaders, who then would take Jesus to Pilate, the Roman governor. So here in Mark 14, we see Jesus in front of the Jewish religious elite. Verse 53, they led Jesus away to the high priest, and all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes gathered together. Peter had allowed him at a, had followed him, I'm sorry, at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he was sitting with the officers and warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council 
kept trying to obtain testimony against Jesus. Why? To put him to death. But they were not finding any. Of course, he was sinless, perfect, God in the flesh. Verse 56, for many were giving false testimony against him, but even their testimony was not consistent. Some stood up and began to give false testimony against Jesus, saying, We heard him saying, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and in three days I will build another temple made without hands. Jesus was referring to his body, his death and his resurrection, which he did accomplish. But, verse 59, not even in this respect was their testimony consistent. Then the high priest stood up, came forward, and questioned Jesus, saying, Do you not answer? What is this that these men are testifying against you? But Jesus kept silent and didn't answer. They had nothing on him. And had he continued to stay silent, they would have had to let him go. But he wasn't here to save himself. He was here to save sinners like you and me. And to fulfill those promises in the Old Testament. Remember the back? The face? The spitting? Being pierced for our transgressions? Crushed for our iniquity? Had he just stayed silent here at this point, they would have had to let him go. But again, he came to fulfill all promises about him. And there's not one promise in the Old Testament that says if he were to find an opportunity to be let go, he would take it. No. He kept silent, didn't answer. Again, the high priest was questioning him and saying, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? And here we go, verse 62. Jesus then spoke. I am. And then quoting from Daniel 7, a passage about the Son of Man, the Divine One. Jesus says, You shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. The Jewish leaders knew what Jesus was saying about himself. I am the promised one, the son of man. And we know they understood that because look at their response. Verse 63, tearing his clothes, the high priest said, what further need do we have of witnesses? You've heard the blasphemy. How does it sound to you? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. They got him, so they thought, because he clearly uh, declared his deity. And then look what happens. Before they take him to Pilate, verse 65, some began to spit at him. Didn't we read that in the servant song? And by the way, in the Greek, it's in the present tense, meaning they continued and continued and continued. And for Jews back then, that was the grossest and greatest insult to spit on somebody in their face. Just like it is today, right? And they just kept on spitting on the Lord of glory. But there was more. They blindfolded him and they beat him with their fists, pulverizing his precious face to the point where it was unrecognizable. Just as one of the servant songs said would happen. They spit on him constantly. They beat him with their fists. Colophos, literally with their knuckles. With such pain, such pain was caused, such torment. And by the way, it's in the present tense, they kept spitting and kept 
punching. And they said to him, Prophesy! And the officers received him with slaps in the face. Oh. The suffering servant. From that animal trough, he set his face like flint to the cross. And this was before the Jews. Now let's go to the Romans, John 19. The Jewish religious leaders, now they take him to Pilate. Well, Pilate examined Jesus, and he saw that Jesus was innocent. And so Pilate tried to do everything to try to convince the bloodthirsty Jewish crowd, hey, let him go. I don't find any guilt in him. Verse 1. So Pilate tries to pacify, appease the crowd. And so what did he do to Jesus? He scourged him, or flogged him. Remember in the servant song? He said, I gave them my back. To be scourged or flogged was one of the most horrific things that could happen to somebody. And many people ended up dying just from that. It was so brutal. They would first strip the person of all his clothing, just leaving him with a little thing around his waist. They would then tie his hands together around a post so that his back would be bowed up and exposed. And they would take like leather whip or tongs where you had a ball at the end of the whip with teeth from animals or even metal on the ball so that when the Roman soldier would flog or scourge somebody, one blow, one. Two. And it just kept going. In fact, several Roman soldiers would be involved in this because one, after doing it for a while, would get tired and would hand off the whip or the tongue to the other one and he would keep doing it. Most scholars believe that the flogging, the scourging that our Lord took was so brutal that his muscles, bones, and even veins were exposed. Think of the servant songs in Isaiah. That precious face pulverized beyond recognition. The spitting, the mocking, the humiliation. And that precious back of his beaten beyond recognition. Well, Pilate thought Maybe he could pacify the bloodthirsty crowd just by beating Jesus so brutally that they would just say, all right, that's enough. Let's not crucify him. And so verse 2, the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns, put it on Jesus' head, put a purple robe on him, and they began to come up to him and say, Hail, King of the Jews, and to give him slaps in the face. Pilate came out again and said to them, Behold, I'm bringing him out to you so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. Jesus then came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said to the crowd, Behold, the man. He was trying to pacify them. Look how pathetic he looks. That's what he was saying to the crowd. Just let him go. Behold, the man. Look at him. 
but verses 6 and 7. When the chief priests and the officers saw Jesus, they cried out, saying, Crucify! Crucify! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no guilt in him. And then the Jews answered him, We have a law. And by that law, he ought to die because he made himself out to be the Son of God. Can you imagine? And that was all prior to the cross. And then the brutality of the cross. Say in chapter 19, verses 28 through 30, as I conclude, our sins were placed on Christ. God's wrath was poured out on Christ instead of on us. Talk about the horrors of hell on that cross. He who knew no sin became sin for us. And then verse 28, after this, knowing that all had, things had been accomplished, to fulfill the scripture, Jesus said, I am thirsty, quoting from Psalm 69, verse 21. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it up to his mouth. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished, paid in full to Telestai, once for all time. Mission accomplished. And then we read, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Is Jesus the promised seed? From the line of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, tribe of Judah, house of David, born of the Virgin Mary, conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born in Bethlehem, and was the suffering servant. who fulfilled his mission to save sinners like you and me. He bowed his head. He gave up his spirit. He died. But three days later, he rose in victory, overcoming sin and death for us. Just as God had promised way back in Genesis 3.15 that the Messiah would reverse the curse and crush Satan's head. And that's what Jesus did. And so as we make our way to Christmas, I want you to think about all those Old Testament promises pointing to Christ, including the promises that he would be the suffering servant. Christmas is a wonderful time. We get together with family, with friends. We exchange gifts. It's just a wonderful time. But please do not forget about Christ in your busyness during this season. And please don't think that as we celebrate his birth, that he just remained that little cute, cuddly baby that whole time. Think about him as the suffering servant and what he endured on the way to the cross and on that cross to save sinners like you and me. And that's why it drives me crazy when I go into certain places or see images of little cute cuddly baby Jesus and a massive statue of Mary or an angel as though Jesus is this helpless little one its whole time. What? Drives me nuts. Because just like the Old Testament promised his birth, it also promised his suffering, his humiliation, and his exaltation. And we worship him. He's not on the cross anymore. He is the conquering king. He is the victorious one. He is the glorious one. And he is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he's coming again to judge the living and the dead. And my hope and prayer is that Jesus truly is your Lord and Savior because apart from him, you cannot save yourself because we all, like sheep, have gone astray and we need him to save us from our sins and to satisfy God's wrath towards us. 
And so hopefully you have repented of your sins and placed your faith and trust in Jesus alone. And for the rest of us who have, take some time right now in silent prayer and just thank him that he is that promised seed. Through the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Judah, the tribe of Judah, the house of David, and his kingdom lasts forever. He is Emmanuel, born of the virgin, born in Bethlehem, put into an animal trough and set his face like flint to the cross. And as the suffering servant, he endured all to save people like you and me. And as the exalted Savior, he is worthy of all worship, honor, and praise, especially as we celebrate his incarnation this time of the year. Amen.